Today at the National Press Club, no campaigner Nungai Warren Mundine. A former politician who has operated on both sides of the aisle, Warren Mundine has been a prominent voice campaigning for a no vote at the upcoming referendum. Warren Mundine with today's National Press Club address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia for today's Westpac address. My name is David Crowe, the Chief Political Correspondent at the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and a director here at the club. Our guest today is Nyungai Warren Mundine, an Indigenous leader for many years and now a key figure in the No campaign against the Indigenous voice at the referendum on October 14. Mr Mundine was born in Grafton, a beautiful town on the New South Wales north coast at a time when segregation was part of everyday life, as you'll hear in his speech, he was raised in poverty as one of 11 children. His family moved to Sydney, he got a job and later went to night school to finish secondary school. He joined the public service, became active in politics. He was Deputy Mayor of Dubbo and became National President of the Labor Party in 2006. I think as the story most or many know, he grew disenchanted with Labor, became Chairman of the Federal Government's Indigenous Advisory Council after Tony Abbott became Prime Minister in 2013. Ran for Parliament as a Liberal candidate, but as the newspapers have reported in recent days, just ruled himself out of the pre-selection for the Liberal Party to choose its next New South Wales Senator. Perhaps, perhaps you have more than enough campaigning to do right now. Uh, we're honoured to have with us Tony Abbott, former Prime Minister, and also Elizabeth Henderson, Warren's wife. Thank you for joining us here today. We're presenting today's address in a slightly different venue than usual, and that's due to some renovations that are being done downstairs. Uh, it's hard to book venues during a referendum when things move around a little bit. Um, so we're presenting this in the upstairs room, but the format remains the same. We'll hear from Mr Mundine, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for questions from the journalists here. For those of you watching at home, you can join the conversation on Twitter, where our handle is at Press Club Ost, or you can use the hashtag NPC. Please welcome Nyungai Warren Mundine to the podium. Thank you. Thank, um, thank you uh, very much, David, for that introduction. And um, I hmm. it, this is uh, this is a great honour to be here today because uh, this is the first time in I'm giving an address to the uh, National Press Club after 30 years in public life. And I really appreciate this, uh, th this invitation and I appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation uh, here and, and, and talk about why uh, <clears throat> we're in the no campaign against the constitutional amendments even though we are in the Situation Room where they seem to herd all us Nova people, but that's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Next month's referendum is one of the most important in Australia's history. Australians will have a choice, a choice of what kind of nation we want to be. Do we want Australia to be a liberal democracy where all people are equal? where all Australians can reconcile and moving ahead, united as a country? Or do we want to be a country where people are divided by race, permanently in conflict with each other over facts of history that cannot be altered? The second pathway is the agenda of the Uluru Statement Authors. This referendum also presents choices for Indigenous Australians. Do we want our traditional nations, our mobs, made into one harmonious group? Or do we want to be segregated again as a race of people in the Constitution? Do we want traditional owner rights usurped? Do we want to cede the fundamental principles 
of our cultures that no one speaks for any, for any other people's country. Because that's what the referendum and this Uluru statement is all about. This month, I had a four-part series of articles leading up to the referendum day on the 14th of October in the Daily Telegraph, written with Dr Vicky Greaves Williams on the Uluru Statement. Both the 439 words on the canvas and the 26-page manifesto that sets out their agenda. What we describe as a symbolic declaration of war against modern Australia. The canvas is a glossy marketing brochure for the misappropriation of culture, a misrepresentation of history, and for a radical and divisive vision of Australia. All done in the name of Indigenous Australians, but working against us. Nearly a decade ago, I gave a speech on Australia Day about reconciliation. I spoke about the difficulties people have moving on from his, his, his historical grievances and how I thought that could be overcome. The ABC brought this uh, speech into focus again recently, trying to frame it as a, a fracture in the No campaign. I shall thank the uh, ABC for giving it renewed attention because my speech highlighted a lingering cloud that, shall that shadows the choices we face. The theme of the speech comes from my Catholic faith. Reconciliation is about absolving, absolution, I should say, from past sins, and it has two parts, sorry and forgiveness. I said, in this country we talk a lot about sorry, but we never talk about the forgiveness part. I said it's not enough that Australia says sorry. Indigenous people also need to forgive Australia as a nation. Many Aboriginals feel angry about past wrongdoings, but these events cannot be undone. So as Aboriginals, we have a choice to continue to feel aggrieved or to draw a line in history and not be captive to that past. Always remember, never forget the history, learn from it, but move forward. The Uluru Statement couldn't be further from the idea of reconciliation. The full manifesto is steeped in grievance. It sees Indigenous Australians as trapped in victimhood and oppression, not free or able to make their own decisions. Self-determination self is an unrealised aspiration. This is a lie. It includes a self-proclaimed history of Indigenous Australia called Our Story written to shame Australians about their non-Indigenous ancestors and Australia's founding. No nation has had a perfect beginning. Most have had bloody and brutal beginnings, founded in invasion, conquest, revolution or war. I don't judge a nation by the worst of its history, but by how it seeks to become its better self. And by that measure, I judge Australia well. I can't think of any nation that has overcome the conflicts and injustice of its past better than Australia. We have taken the best of our history and built a nation where everyone is equal, where any person, regardless of their origin, can aspire to and achieve the highest. When my parents were first married, they lived in a bark shelter on the Man River. My oldest brother, Roy, took his first steps there. As a young man, Roy joined the army and served all over the world. 
He was severely injured in Vietnam, losing his leg. He was mentioned in dispatches for his bravery and is highly decorated for his service to our country, including the Medal of the Order of Australia Military Division. In 2016, he was named the Australian Army's first Indigenous Elder. Bess Price was born in the desert in Central Australia. She was her mother's ninth child. Four of her siblings died in infancy. When Bess was born, she was tiny and sickly. Her mother left her to die, but she was saved by another woman in her community. Bess lived most of her childhood in Humpies. She was promised in marriage to be the second wife of her sister's husband. But Bess persuaded her father against it. She had a first child, a son to another man at 13. She experienced violence and later the death of her son from cancer. And you know what? Bess graduated from university. She went on to become a Minister of the Crown in the Northern Territory Government. She is a member of the Order of Australia. Let that sink in. She began her life in the worst of circumstances and today she is a member of the Order of Australia. These are two people I love and admire. Australia is a nation where a child born under segregation and living in a humpy can go on and, and to great achievements. I was born in the 1950s. I know you're looking at me and thinking, that can't be right, he's a very <laughs> handsome, young looking man. But I was. One of 11 children. I grew up in poverty. For the first, year, first 13 years of my life, I lived under segregation, like all Aboriginals. We were controlled by government protection boards, whose segregation regimes were put in place in the 1800s by well-meaning people who thought Aboriginals couldn't take care of themselves. These bureaucratic segregation systems controlled every aspect of our lives. My father couldn't have a drink in a pub after cricket with his mates. His wages was taken by the government and he was paid an Aboriginal allowance. Aboriginals in New South Wales were subject to a 5pm curfew. My dad was arrested for breaking curfew uh, coming home after working late. Authorities could walk into our homes without notice. I have a funny story about my mother. Uh, one day a welfare board officer walked into our house. My mother, all four foot 11 inches of her, had had enough and she chased him out of the house with a broom. She said, we own this house and you can't come in. And they never come back again. These protection regimes kept us down and held us back from a full Australian life. They were abolished after the 1967 referendum when Australians overwhelmingly voted to remove racial segregation from the Constitution for everyone to be equal under the law. Now the Ab Albanese government wants to put racial segregation back into our Constitution. No other group of Australians will have a body entrenched in the Constitution to speak on their behalf with a single voice. Only one race of people will be treated in this way. This month, Senator Jacinta Napajimpa Price and Senator, Senator Karen Little and I are talking to Australians all over the country. We'll be urging them to vote no in the referendum. All three of us are Aboriginal and we oppose the voice. 
We believe Australia is a great nation and that all Australians, including Aboriginals, can be proud to be a part of it. We believe Indigenous Australians are not condemned by their past and certainly not the experiences of their ancestors. We, be we believe traditional owners should be able to speak for themselves about how they want to live their lives on their own countries. Not told what to do or what to think by some centralised overlord, be it the Central Land Council or the Voice or a Makarata uh, Commission. The Yes campaign is out there every day accusing the No campaign of lying. But the Yes campaign is built on a pack of lies. One lie is that Indigenous people don't currently have a voice. That Indigenous people aren't listened to in making laws and policies. It's the opposite. Indigenous Australians have many voices. Hundreds of Indigenous organisations are immersed in policy making affecting Indigenous Australians. Corporations, sporting codes, religious groups, unions, every arm of local, state, territory and federal governments, every agency and bureaucracy have Indigenous advisory bodies or other formal consultations. Nothing happens on Aboriginal land without consultation with traditional owners through native title and land rights legislation. There are more Indigenous par parliamentarians today than ever before, including the Minister for Indigenous Australians. And there's no door in Canberra that isn't wide open for Indigenous Australians who want their voice heard. Another lie is that the voice will give good advice. Indigenous bodies can give bad advice, like the Coalition of the Peaks who advocated against the cashless debit cards. They didn't have all the answers. Another lie is that the voice is just an advisory committee. It's not. It is an entrenched, permanent political right to make representations to the parliament and the executive. Distinguished professors of constitutional law told the parliamentary committee the voice will have quote unquote similar constitutional status as the parliament, the executive and the high court. But unlike these institution, institutions, no one knows what the voice is. When the Constitution was written, we had hundreds of years of precedence under the Westminster system. So we knew what a High Court is, what a Parliament is, and what the Executive is. We had no idea what a voice is. Another lie is that 80% of Indigenous people want the voice, and it comes out of a grassroots Indigenous movement. Even ABC Fact Check said that the claim doesn't stack up. Many Aboriginals have never heard of the voice, especially those in remote and regional Australia who are most in need. Many Aboriginals are voting no. The regional dialogues leading up to the Uluru Statement were attended by a small number of Indigenous people handpicked to, quote unquote, ensure consensus. Professor Megan Davis let the cat out of the bag when she said the dialogues did, quote unquote, rubber stamp the voice. Another lie is that the voice will change Indigenous lives for the better. Read the official yes pamphlet. The voice sounds like some magical wand that will solve all the problems if only we would just let it. Prime Minister Albanese has said 
If you vote no, you'll get more of the same. Actually, if you vote yes, you'll get more of the same. But it will be in the Constitution. It will be in the Constitution. Al Albanese says the current approach has failed. The voice will take the current approach, wrap it in more bureaucracy and entrench it in the Constitution forever. If the purpose of the voice is to end disadvantage, it shouldn't be in the Constitution because that's permanent. That says Indigenous Australians will always live in poverty, that we'll always need help, that we are destined for permanent disadvantage. That's exactly what people thought in the 1800s when they set up the protection regimes, when they set up segregation. The fact is, most Indigenous Australians are doing fine. They go to school, go to work, run businesses and take care of their families. And they aren't in prison. They don't need a special Indigenous voice. It's wrong to tell young people growing up in, in these families that they are disadvantaged because they are Indigenous. It's wrong to tell them as I have heard many times during this campaign, that they are more likely to go to prison than to university because it's just not true. Where we need to focus is on the, those Aboriginals, those Indigenous Australians who are struggling. Most of them are living in remote communities or are trapped in intergenerational welfare dependency or both. The voice will not help them. The biggest lie of all is that the No campaign, people like Senator Price and Senator Little and myself, have no plan or even don't want to improve Indigenous opportunities. I don't believe anyone in this country wants to see any Indigenous Australians continue to struggle. Certainly not us. We have devoted most of our adult lives to advocating for and, and supporting Indigenous people in need. We have battle opposition, disinterest and vested interests. We will continue to battle. But nothing will change unless there is a focus on four critical areas. Firstly, there needs to be accountability. Governments have spent billions. Where is, is all this funding going? What is it being used for? What outcomes have all these community organisations and service providers who receive all this fun funding actually achieved? Secondly, education. The same year I delivered my Australia Day speech, the Forest Review creating parity was released. It contained a very interesting fact. There's no disparity for Indigenous Australians who are educated at the same level as other Australians. So if you want a simple idea to close the gap, it's getting all Indigenous children to school. Just imagine if every Indigenous child went to school every day. Think about what a profound impact that would have. We have celebrities, corporates, law firms, sporting codes, religious groups, local, state, territory and federal governments, unions devoting massive time and money campaigning for the voice. Imagine if they devoted all of that energy to, to getting Indigenous children into a school. Sadly, I know from my own experience advising governments and dealing with bureaucrats, education departments and teachers unions, that many of those who have the power to achieve this one goal don't use it as they could. The third area is economic participation. Growing up in the way I did, 
I learnt the only solution to poverty is economic participation. I saw this with my parents and grandparents who were determined to own their own home and to ensure their kids got educated and into employment. This made all the difference for us. I don't know any group of people in the world that, have, that has lifted out of poverty without economic participation. If every Indigenous child went to school and every Indigenous adult went to work, there would be no gap. Fourthly, social change. This requires confronting some hard truths. People need to stop turning a blind eye to the violence, abuse, co coercive control and destructive behaviour that goes on in some Indigenous communities. Senator Price, Senator Little and I have been speaking about these problems for years. For their efforts, Senator Price and her mother, Bess Price, have been subject to some of the most racist and misogynist abuse for raising these issues. When was the last time any of these large corporations barracking for the voice raised awareness about violence and abuse in remote Aboriginal communities? When will Qantas paint one of its planes with a call to confront the violence and abuse of Aboriginal women and children in remote Australia. If we as a nation are sincere about closing the gap, we need to deal with what I call the, the, enthusiasm, the enthusiasm gap. Lots of well-intended people are enthusiastic about the symbolism of the shiny new thing, the voice. But when it comes to doing the challenging work on specific areas of need, the enthusiasm wanes. That's, new, that's human nature, I suppose. And it is a tru truism that applies beyond Indigenous concerns. But if we really want to better the lives of our most disadvantaged Australians, we have no choice but to stay engaged for the long haul. Accountability, education, economic participation, social change. These are not complicated ideas, but they require politi political will to, ensure, to, ins to, to happen. The referendum will be a choice between two opposing visions for Indigenous Australians. One is a vision of segregation, bureaucratic control and dependency, and a mindset focused on historical grievance and identity politics. The other is a vision of economic particip participation, financial independence and self-determination, and a mindset focused on jobs, education, social stability and practical initiatives. This is the vision of Jacinta Price and Carrie Little and myself and many other Aboriginals who oppose the voice. The voice is not about whether Indigenous Australians are recognised, respected or listened to. And it's certainly not about how to improve the lives of Indigenous people. I believe many well-meaning Australians support the voice because they believe it will solve problems, because they believe Indigenous people want it, and because they want to see something positive and symbolic develop in the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Sadly, I think many Australians also feel they must support the voice because of misplaced guilt about Australia's history. But I don't think all of these supporters have grasped the path this referendum has taken us down. I believe they don't see the threat that the voice poses to Aboriginal traditional owners and to the character of Australia itself. 
The voice is a political ploy to grab power, not just from the Australian nation, but also from traditional owners. We know from the Calma Langton report that the voice is intended to be a vast, expensive new bureaucracy interposed at every level of government decision making. In 1967, we fought against segregation and to get bureaucrats off our backs. We don't want them to return. Senator Price, Senator Little and I were all born in remote and regional Australia. Our lived experiences and those of our families in, include growing up on missions and reserves, segregation, the experiences of the stolen generation, poverty, violence and mistreatment by authorities. All the things activists today are so aggrieved about. We have also seen the good of this nation and the good of its people and its institutions and the great promise it offers to all Australians. Our stories are testament to this. All of us must work harder to create opportunities for other stories. We oppose the radical and divisive voice. That pathway will not lift Indigenous Australians. It will not reconcile Australians. It will only divide us and keep us that way. And that's why we are voting no to the voice. Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech, Mr Mundine. Uh, we've got plenty of questions from the journalists here today, but I'll kick off. I thought it was very interesting. You mentioned the corporates who are in favour of The Voice, but also you mentioned your personal faith, and I've, I'm finding that very interesting at the moment because uh, it can be a neglected part of this debate. Most of the peak faith groups are actually in favour of The Voice. Mm. That support comes from the Anglicans, from the Catholics, from the Quakers, from the Uniting Church, from the Executive Council of Australian Jury and from others. Mm. And I wanted to put to you something that somebody said to me the other day on the Christian argument in favour of the voice and get your response to it. This is from Simon Hansford, who's a Uniting Church Minister. And he says, it's quite clear that our First Nations people are the ones who are most as a group marginalised and pushed to the edges and traditionally and historically ignored. What people of faith would want to say is that where we would find Jesus is most likely to be with those who are most in need. Indigenous people are those who are in need in Australia, so isn't there a Christian case in favour of voting for the voice? Of course we agree on all of what was said about the disadvantage and that for some Indigenous people. Now, I, I say that deliberately because not all Indigenous people are all the same. Myself is included in that. Noel Pearson, Professor uh, Marcia Langton... Uh, Professor Megan Davis and many other, thousands of other Aboriginals who are doctors and lawyers and bankers and everything <laughs> around this country. The problem we're having with The Voice, it puts us as one group and it acts like we're all one and the same. What we should be doing is, and this is what the Christian churches and the Muslims and everyone else should be looking at, at that hierarchical level, on the ground, now I'm a Catholic, on the ground people of those faiths are actually voting against the, the voice and, and the, 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 um, the polling shows that today. It's about focusing on those people who are struggling and need help and that's where we should be focusing on and that's where we should be spending our time and money, not on this whole homogenous uh, Indigenous Australian. Our next, our next question is from Rosie Lewis. Rosie Lewis from The Australian. Mr Mundine, would you have been more amenable to a national voice if being enshrined in the constitution, if it had been legislated first and proven to have work over years? Yeah. I'm, really, um, I'm reminded of uh, when the Prime Minister and the Minister for Indigenous Australians went up to Alice Springs and thanks to the media for dragging him up there to confront the serious is in issues that were happening there. Uh, and they said, oh, if we had a 
had a voice, none of this would be happening. And so my question is, prove it. What is, what is this voice? And then my second part was, if you truly believe that... No, and look, I accept that the Prime Minister and the Minister for Indigenous Australians and the people who are voting yes really believe that, that this will, this will be the thing that will... the panacea that will fix everything, then why don't you legislate? Why don't you test it? And the answer to that was, no, we want to leave it until after the referendum. And so I, I don't understand that. If you really passionately believe about that, then why don't you start it as soon as possible? Mm -hmm. Our next question is from John Paul Janke. John Paul Janke from The Point on NITV and SBS Warren. Good to see you again. We're looking Good forward you, to having you on the program on yep. October the 10th. And We'd also welcome you to put in a good yeah, word. Yeah, be gentle with me, JP. We yeah. always will be. Uh, we also hope you can put in a good word with us with Senator Price to appear on the program. I think we've put in about 10 invitations for her to appear on the point, but if you could get <laughs> your foot in the door and get her on the program, we'd, we'd welcome your support. Yeah. I want to talk about the national conversation we're having about the referendum. Mm. Last month, a comedian at CPAC, the, the gathering at CPAC, mocked the welcome to country mm. by labelling traditional owners as violent black men. Hmm. Now, you're the chair of CPAC, and you're yet to condemn or apologise for these comments. And even Barnaby Joyce, when he came on The Point a few weeks ago, he said he found the comments offensive and he even apologised. Am I a violent black man? Are you a violent black man? Are our sons violent black men? Are our fathers? Because hmm. our communities are being bombarded by racist, offensive, bigoted speech, which is driving a surge in the psychological harm that they're experiencing. So how do these comments add to the respectful conversation we're having on constitutional recon recognition? And speaking of a respectful debate, last week CPAC's media advisor made online comments questioning the Aboriginality of Linda Burney, Thomas Mayo, Noel Pearson, Marcia Langton and Senator Melendiri McCarthy and others saying, these guys look just as European as they do Aboriginal. What happens when it comes to pay the rent? Do they collect reparations with their Aboriginal hand and return it with their European hand? So my question is, do you condemn both these comments? What action will you take? And how do they actually add to this respectful debate we're having on constitutional recognition? Well, when you start looking at uh, putting race in the constitution of a particular groups, Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders, then you open it up to those debates in regard to, OK, who are these Aboriginal people and do they, uh, are they Aboriginal or are they not Aboriginal? This is a conversation, as you know, JP, that is a big argument within the Aboriginal community. We argue about it every day, about people who are considered Indigenous or not Indigenous. And there's questions that are raised every day within the Aboriginal community about that. And so when you go down the path of uh, putting race in the constitution, this is the path you go down. This is where you end up. You end up talking about this stuff and then you have arguments and debates about who's Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander and who isn't Aboriginal and who is, isn't uh, Torres Strait Islander. And we've seen this through a number of things over the years and a number of these arguments. So to be... When you, when you want to do these things, this is where you open up these arguments and fights. So for me, you know, and also, like, you're talking about a comedian, you know, comedians, you know, they, they do what comedians do. I'm a great support, uh, great uh, admirer of uh, David Chappelle, and I go to, I've been to his concerts, and some of the things he says at his concerts uh, and events, are, you know, you can take him pretty badly if you want to in that. Now, I'm not saying I agree with his com comedy or anything like that, but he's a comedian. He does his thing, and that's it. it so this is, this is where we are today. And so, you know, to me, you know, we, we have opened that door for those debates, and we can't really complain about them if we open those doors. Our next question is from Tom McElroy. Oh. Thanks for your speech, Mr Mundine, and for taking Thank our you. questions. I'm eager to follow up John Paul's question. Isn't it one thing to open the door to questions and jokes from comedians about 
um, indigeneity and ethnicity and um, people's self-identification. But shouldn't leaders in a constitutional debate, a referendum like we're having, call out an attack on someone who clearly identifies as Indigenous and has a long um, heritage in their family, for example, the ministers and parliamentarians that John Paul mentioned. I, I, I'm keen to give you another opportunity to give your view of those comments, because aren't, aren't they unbecoming of a debate about changing the constitution? Aren't they racist themselves? They're not my words. No, but They're a comedian's words. Yeah, but Adam, a comedian Adam, can make jokes, let's be honest. They're David. Chappelle and, and transgender. Now, that's his comedy. That's his jokes. That's what he makes. And he's allowed to do that. This is what comedy is. Comedy is about pushing buttons and going right to the edge. Now, whether I agree with uh, those comments or that is irrelevant. I'm not going to be standing here and, and, and becoming the uh, overlord of what is comedy and what is not comedy. They have freedom to, to have comedy and make jokes. But as the chair of the organisation, you have no problem with them on your platform? Yeah. Well, they were there. They, they made those things. Uh, that's a comedy show. You know, as I said, I don't agree with a lot of things, but that's comedy. I'm not the overlord of free speech in regard to how comedians should be making jokes. Next question is from Nicole Hegarty. <laughs> Nicole Hegarty from the ABC. Uh, Warren, you've said that the Uluru Statement from the Heart is a symbolic declaration of war. I'm wondering which words in that statement you're relying on to form that view. Well, when you look at it, and as I said, uh, you know, it, it's, not, it's a canvas, you know, that 439 words on that front page where the signatures are. And there's also the 28 pages behind that. The 28 pages behind that, if people have read them and you go through it, and I've currently uh, got a, uh, a four-article uh, critique of that, of what's on the cover and what's the 28 pages behind. The 28 pages is about the manifesto of how it's going to be put in place and how it's going to be operated. And in that, they put 10-point... Their ideas are the ten points that need to be raised, and they cover a whole whole wide range of things that people can't get away from. And it does talk about sovereignty, and it does talk about uh, treaties, and it talks about a whole wide range of other things that are in that document. Uh, so you just can't ignore that page, those twenty eight pages, and that's where it, that's where it comes at because it is a challenge to Australian society. You know, that, you know Pre Professor Megan Davis talks about dual sovereignty and other things like that, you know, that the Ill illegitimate founding of this country, people talk about those things. You can't ignore that, those words. Uh, you know what? Australia is an illegitimate country now. You can't ignore that. That's an attack on the legi legitimacy of Australia. Next question is from Paul Sakal. Thanks, Mr Mundine. It's Paul Sakal from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Um, you, you and Jacinta Price, Senator Jacinta Price, a couple of weeks ago, you, you're challenging kind of notions of Indigenous victimhood and suggesting that it's not as serious a problem as kind of the, mm. the media and political establishment would have you believe. In August last year, you were involved in a class action in the Northern Territory uh, that won $50 million mm. for victims of the stolen generations. You said mm. that they suffered terrible ongoing yes. um, injustices and they deserve financial compensation. Um, Kerry White, who's on your board, the Recognizer yeah. Better Way board, says that the stolen generations is a myth. Um, you're challenging victimhood notions today. How do you reconcile those two things? Well, look, I'm, I'm Warren Mundine. I talk to everyone. If I only just spoke to people who I agree with, how do I make a better future for this country? I talk to people who make dreadful statements who have racist statements and that, and I sit and talk to them. Why? Because I want to make this country, as I said in this speech, a better place. You know, what are we going to do? We're wandering around the countryside with pitchforks and fire sticks and burning people at the stake or doing things like that. No, I go and have a cup of tea with people and talk to them. And, and have discussions about, about changing those things. The difference between victimhood and, and the stolen generation 
is that when we're talking about victimhood, we're talking about things that happened years ago, so, which I wasn't around and other people w were, weren't around. Uh, when we're talking about the stolen generation and, and those things, what we're talking about, we're actually talking about people who actually suffered. Yeah. They were the ones who suffered. And that's why I stood up with the, uh, the, the court cases and I fight in that, those court cases for the stolen generation because those people need justice. That's why I'm doing it. It's like with the stolen wages. I'm doing the stolen wages court cases. I'm doing it because here are men and women who worked. They weren't lazy. They weren't bludgers. They worked. And the government took their money. I want the government to give their money back and to, be, to those people because they deserved it. They worked for it and they worked hard for it and they weren't bludgers. That's totally different to something that happened in 1860 and it's affecting us now. What I'm talking about is whether you agree with victimhood or not or whether you agree with uh, you know, colonial intergeneration trauma, there is a stage you have to move on. It's in history. It's a fact, you know it, you learn about it, and you how do you and you take that experience and you move forward. If we don't do that, you know, uh, then we're we're all going to lay down in a fetal position for the rest of our our life. We we need to move forward. That's not to say that we forget about it, that we don't acknowledge it, we don't mem remember it, and it become we do. If we're going to have our kids move forward, then we have to give them positivity. We have to show them how to, to, to get educated and get jobs. And if we don't do that, then they're going to just, generation after generation, just suffer. So if you're arguing for help for people who are victims of the stolen generation, mm -hmm. and if you're seeking some kind of payment for people who suffered from stolen wages, mm -hmm. that kind of links in with one of the big things that's running on social media at the moment, which is that the voice is about reparations. Uh, are you seeking compensation for Indigenous people, whether or not the, the voice gets up on issues like the stolen generation and stolen wages? Isn't that, you know, the same question of compensation and reparation? No, it's not, because uh, my dad was working and he actually was getting a, a wage. He didn't get that wage. It was taken by the government. Now, he could have been black, he could have been green, he could have been purple, but that was his money that was taken off him. Right? It was stolen from him. And so, therefore, we're talking, about we're talking about getting his money back, which he was deserved to have, because under the legislation, under the, the, uh, the Aboriginal Protection Boards, they were holding the money in trust, and that means they were holding it in trust, and eventually these people were going to get their money back. They didn't get it back. And so that's what we're talking about there. Reparations is a, is, and it's, it's a big battle, in the, I know, in the United States about slavery and stuff like that. People today are not slaves. Right? But if, not slaves. I guess the, the point I'm trying to get at is if, if there's a big scare running online about the voice leading the way to compensation. Isn't compensation happening through the courts now anyway? No, compensation is happening in regard to a factual thing that happened to that individual. That's the difference. <laughs> the, the next question is from mm -hmm. Tom Connell. Thanks, Mr Mundine. Tom Connell from Sky News. You spoke about education, which mm. arguably, you know, of children might be the most important element of closing the gap. And you spoke about the fact that there are Indigenous voices out there, of course there are many of them out there right now, mm. but also of, you mentioned bureaucrats, they don't listen, they don't take up the ideas, they don't do the right thing. Isn't that actually an argument for a voice that's harder to ignore? Perhaps not one that's designed along the way we've been told it will be, but isn't that an argument that you need something bigger that's harder to ignore compared to the Indigenous voices which work hard today, but seemingly are being ignored by people who are in charge? Mm. Well, I wouldn't go to say that they're completely ignoring them. I've, I've sat at the table where bureaucrats are and they, they listen to us, but the issue for me is about enthusiasm, about, OK, how do we take, like, the Closing the Gap report and the Productivity report 
two brilliant reports that go, that go to Parliament every year, which points out where the gaps are and what's happening and what's working and what's not working. We should be then utilising those reports and moving forward. And just a few weeks ago, the Productivity Commission brought out that said, you know, for every dollar that, that's put into Indigenous Affairs, 33 cents, only 33 cents of it actually gets to the ground. Now, if I ran a business like that, I'd be bankrupt. If I had 63% of all my, uh, all my money in, that's coming into my business is on administration, and then it's not going to work. The business would go broke. So what we need to do, and we got it now, is that uh, through native title and land rights, uh, our culture is about who, who we are. And now I'm a Bundjalung man, and that's my nation, and so me and my Bundjalung people, people who love me and hate me, we talk about our country and we only can talk about our country and not someone else's country. And we see that in the mining industry, we see that in the energy industry, we see that in the agricultural industry and we see it in the government industry where when you want to do things on Aboriginal land, you have to sit down, con uh, consult, negotiate and come to agreement with them. That's in place now, and it's resulted in uh, billions of dollars coming through uh, the, uh, the mining industry, the energy industry and so on, uh, going to uh, Aboriginal Trust and Aboriginal Community Group. What the issue is, we've got the voice. What are we doing with that money? What are we doing to that which is supposed to be helping people, which is owned by those Aboriginals on the ground? So that's what we've got to be focusing on. We should be focusing on those communities, where that money should be going and what's happening with it. But we don't. Next question is from Josh Butler. Hi, Mr Mundine. Josh Butler from The Guardian. Oh, there you go, um, Josh. Okay. You say in your speech there's a need to draw a line in history and move on from a clean slate. Can I ask, please, because you didn't mention it in your speech about your support for Indigenous treaties, please. Isn't the whole point of a treaty about acknowledging historical things that have gone wrong? And uh, additionally, if it is a no vote, what would you do and how quickly would you work to advance treaties? Well, but when, we're talking, when we're talking about uh, acknowledgement and that, and you talk about the treaties and that, we've, we've acknowledged it. And in a way we've acknowledged it was in 1976 when we knew that uh, colonial Australia took land off Aboriginals. So we put in place, to compensate for that, we put in place the, the Aboriginal land rights legislation. And, we, and also then we went through the court systems and we ended up with the native title stuff. Do you know today that 55% of Australia's land mass has been given back to Aboriginals? And over the next 10 to 15 years, it's going to be nearly up to 70 to 80% of Australia's land mass will be going back to Aboriginal peoples. So that's through the acknowledgement that we took this land and we put legislation in place that would return land back to Aboriginal people. And that's what's happening. So, uh, you know, a lot of the things when people talk about treaties and they talk about a whole lot of other stuff is that they're, they're not focusing on what's happening today. And so you're seeing all these uh, agreements that are going out through native title and for land rights, which are doing massive things for the, uh, for the potential to lift Aboriginal people out of poverty and to make their community strong and safe. The issue is that we're not doing that. We, they got the land, 55% of Australia's land mass. Uh, what is happening with that? And what are they doing about that to help their people? But what would you do about treaties? You, you, you've said that in the event of a no vote, it would be more likely that there will be treaties in well, Australia. Well, th these things are happening now and they'll continue to move forward into the, into the future. I've I got to do things with my own people in regard to uh, th these discussions about what happens on our land and how we uh, get benefits and do things moving forward. And, uh, and that's just a continuation of what's happening. Why do you want treaties? Why do you want treaties after this vote? Whether it's yes or no, why do you think treaties are good? Why do you think uh, Indigenous people should have them? Well, I don't think people know what, it, what, the, what they're talking about when they're talking about treaties. I, I just explained that there's an acknowledgement by our, from 
the colonial period uh, that we took land of Aboriginals. And that's why the Land Rights Act was coming to power in, in most of the states and at the federal level. Uh, that's where the native title court case come from and then the legislation come out of that as well. That's acknowledging the past wrongs of what happened and about how do we move forward to fix that. And that's where it moves through uh, those traditional owner nations who, re who recruit their land. Um, plenty of uh, ground to cover. Our next question is mm. from Pablo Vinales. Thank you, Mr. Mundine. Pablo Vinales from SBS. Ah, good day. I wanted to ask you if there is an overall yes vote in the population, but it fails in, in states and territories. What will be the message that you and the no case will take from this? And what is the way forward to reconciliation where uh, both sides of the debate could come together? Uh, it, it, it's one of those interesting things of federation that we have in Australia where it, it's a two, two thing. It's, you know, you've not only got to get the, the, uh, the majority of Australians support, 50 plus one, but you also got to get the majority of states uh, which is four states to, to get the pass. Now that was done for particular reasons and I think some people forget that. To get Federation to come together, they, the, the, the New South Wales and Victoria would have dominated the new Australia. So to make Tasmania and South Australia and West Australia and Queensland feel comfortable about joining the Federation, that's why they brought the majority of states in. And so for us, it's, uh, it's it depends where those numbers drop to see what we need to do. But the important thing is, and, and it's either, and the important thing is whether, and it doesn't count on whether the yes campaign win or the no campaign wins. We've got to wake up uh, Sunday morning on the 15th of October and actually still do the hard work that we've got to do. <laughs> Next question is from Eliza Edwards. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Warren. Um, how I'd do have you to give you a box <laughs> or something. <laughs> Hi, challenge. Uh, how do you see the lives of Indigenous Australians improving in the event of a no vote? Well, I, I, I just said it. Um, we, we've got to start doing the hard yards. And even, even if it was a yes vote, it's still the hard yards that we have to do. One is we've got to spend our money better and they've got to be focused on outcomes and how we can do those things and, 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 and make sure that money is spent properly. The other thing is uh, we've got to, you know, whether, I don't, whether people like it or not, education is the key, it's always the key. And it opens the door for a better life for people, opens the door for people to improve their lives. So we've got to get kids to school. We've got to get people into the complete school and we've got to get people into universities and trades and whatever. That things we have to do. And that's going to there. And then the other one, of course, is economic participation. You're not going to improve anyone's life unless you've got education and a job. That's just the facts of, of life. If you don't have an education and a job, you know, or running a business, and then you're not going to improve your life. And they're the things that we have to do. But the other thing that plays a major role in this, and we saw this uh, when they got insanely got rid of the grog bans and, and the cashless debit card was that uh, the problems that arose that that swarmed into Alice Springs and are still the same today it hasn't changed much is that we've got to be fair dinkum about what we've got to do there. Uh, Peter Malinakis as people may know is the Premier of South Australia when he was the Minister for um, uh, the Minister for Corrective Services he got me to head the inquiry into adult prisons and re-offending in, in South Australia. And, and we had to face some hard stuff. 52% of Aboriginal people who were in jail in South Australia were there for serious crimes. Serious crimes. So you're talking about not only rape, but rape and trying to murder, murder someone. A whole wide range of those things. And most of those crimes were against Aboriginal people. So we've got to face that reality and then work on things about how do we fix those things. Hmm. Next question is from Melissa Code. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mr Mundine. Melissa mm -hmm. Code from the mm -hmm. Mandarin. I'd Sorry. like to ask you some questions about um, the no supporters' position on the referendum proposal being uh, legally risky. 
Um, so earlier this week, we had the Law Council of Australia, some leading constitutional law experts, Kenneth Hayne, Cheryl Saunders, reiterate that the proposal um, was safe and modest. But today in your speech, you talked about um, concerns about the permanence that the voice represented, and you also talked about um, worries about how this was opening a racist conversation. There are existing race powers in the Constitution. How do you reconcile that fact against the position uh, you take? And also, what is your view on a kind of dispassionate, apolitical expert position that um, it's a safe and modest proposal? Well, I don't believe that. And you know why I don't believe it? Because the Law Society of New South Wales, Victoria, uh, Western Australia and so on are in the yes camp. Why would I trust them? This is the insanity of the Law Society in them to actually take a position on this. Because if I get in trouble with the law, how do I know I'm going to get a fair trial from those lawyers? How am I going to know if I'm going to be treated decently? Because they signed up to the Yes campaign. Sorry, Mr. Martin, how, what has that got to do with the Constitution amending the... It's got a lot to do with it because it's about our legal system. Our legal system, if people remember outside our courts and everything, it is a statue of a woman who's blindfolded, who, who, who dispassionately looks at the... Uh, is only dealing with the evidence. It's got to, nothing to do with race, it's got nothing to do with religion or anything like that. It's about whether a person uh, has committed a crime or hasn't committed a crime. Mm -hmm. and That's so, what the law is about. And so, so how can the law societies, quite frankly, who are the guardians of our, of our legal system, can sign up to one side of politics I, I believe it's the just position, insanity for them to do it. I believe the position is, and just to give you an opportunity to respond, mm. because the Constitution mm. represents a framework of principles. Yes. Um, and this is a way to give Indigenous recognition, and so that that recognition isn't symbolic, the voice exists. So would you like to respond to how that is, is problematic and legally risky? Well, it, it is, because, it, uh, you know, you, lawyers are like um, economists. You get two lawyers in a room and you get three, four or five different debates. Uh, you know, I've got, and it's, it's amazing, I've got lawyers, and constitutional lawyers, professors of laws and that, who dispute that. So, you so this idea, and this is where I know where the Law Society is getting itself in big trouble, this idea that the Law Society can say this is the answer is fallacy. It's just nonsense. And, the and, and it opens it up for a legal argument. Yeah. <laughs> Melissa, we, we will have to move on, but I think in Race fairness... Powers. But in fairness, one of the people who's supporting The Voice is a former Chief Justice of the High Court. He's not a practising lawyer. You know, this, we're, talking about, we're talking about Robert French. So, yes. Uh, or Ken Hain, another former High Court judge. Yeah, Are, they yeah, Are they wrong? Are they wrong? I mean, I'll te I tell you, you what. Can't get a of you know who's the Chief, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who just retired? Kiefer, right? She was outvoted <laughs> by the other members of the High Court on the Love case. So just because you're a Chief Justice or just because you're a Justice doesn't mean you don't get outvoted by your fellow Justices. They do. <laughs> right. He, he does happen to be a former Chief Justice. I know he's a former Chief Justice, so is Kiefer, but she got outvoted. Okay. okay, you've got to be consistent, you've got to be consistent and, and face the facts. And you're not doing that, David, uh, I'm sorry. No, I'm giving you a chance to respond. <laughs> you, you have the podium, it's only... Yes, all right, that's fine. <laughs> uh, the fact is that the Chief Justice is not the complete... Um, fountain of all legal arguments. And I just pointed out to you that Chief Justices have been overruled in the High Court. The, and that's a fact. <laughs> the, the next question is from Dan Jarvis Brady. I'll keep it short. Dan Jervis Barty from the West Australian. The No campaign has been accused of using Trump-style politics or Trump-style campaigning tactics during the referendum, including using multiple Facebook pages that push different messages to, to different groups. How do you respond to, to those accusations? And as someone who has been involved in public life for so long, are you comfortable with, with those sort of tactics and 
how they're sort of feeding into our politics, <laughs> becoming a permanent feature? I don't take lectures from people who call me a racist because I'm voting no. This idea of people just because they're not winning an argument, they're not presenting an argument, they then say, oh, the tactics over here are Trumpers and the Trumpers. You know what? I was sitting at a, a meeting with a client of mine and he got a text message from another person who said, I heard you're voting no, so you are a racist pig. That's what the word said. So I don't take lectures from people who use language like that in regard to saying, oh, this is Trumpers and this is not Trumpers, you know? It's, it's a dem democratic process, and I can tell you, when people talk to me and they say that, that the no campaign is liars and, and, and racist and all that type of thing, you only have to see my, uh, you know, my social media page, and you've seen the threats that, happen, that have gone when someone gave out, um, uh, gave out uh, Senator Price's phone number, and she's got federal police following around with her every day now because of those threats. I don't, I don't take nonsense like that from anyone. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we're, uh, we're going to continue with a few more questions. We're going yeah. to pass 135. If you're on the main ABC channel, you can switch to the ABC News channel and we'll continue taking some yeah. questions. There's uh, plenty of topics to cover. Our next one is from Natalie Vikrov. You'll have to bring the mic. <laughs> I tried that last time and it made it. Okay, amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for your speech, uh, Natalie Vickrow from mm. the Canberra Times. Uh, in your 2017 essay, uh, Practical Recognition from <laughs> the mom's sorry. Uh, from the mob's perspective, uh, you talk about some of the criticisms that a uh, campaign for a voice body could run up against um, and you talk about how advocates need to think like their detractors. Um, some of the criticisms, principal criticisms you've outlined are that, you know, a body like would uh, replicate the uh, failed and abolished uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, that it will amount to uh, a new and separate Indigenous Parliament and that uh, Indigenous Australians will have two votes while others will only have one. Uh, you say that each is a distortion of truth. Um, do, you, has, do you agree that the No Camp has embodied, has, has taken up uh, these very arguments, and do you still and do you still agree that they are an, a distortion uh, of truth? Gee, you're a very good researcher. I, I can't even remember that far back. Um, the, the No campaign is a very simple campaign. Uh, we go and talk, and we and uh, and it's not a secret. We you know we started our campaign as soon as. Um, the Prime Minister stood up at Gama and said, this is what we're going to do. And, and what we did, we knew that we, were, we didn't have... You know, you saw the pages in the newspapers and other areas. You know, I, someone sent me a, a text message which listed all the organisations and bodies, like you talked about the religious organisations and that. Uh, so from day one, what we did was we, t we spoke to the people who go to church, not, not the bishops, not the archbishops, not the uh, priests. We spoke to people who go to church. We went to the mo mosque. In fact, uh, we, we got so many volunteers out of some of the mosques, it's not funny, but the Emmons Council supports the Yes campaign. Uh, we went and spoke to the corporate's employees and the corporate's clients and customers. And this is where you're seeing this... This, this huge divide. If you looked at some of the breakdowns of the polling and everything like that, people over two hundred thousand dollars a year vote yes. People under two hundred thousand dollars a year, they vote no. And so there's a massive divide which is happening in this country in regard to not only about race, but about uh, status, about people. You know, and and this, I I think this is a dangerous place we're going down. We're going down to a very dangerous place. And the idea that, uh, you know, a senator, an Aboriginal woman, can receive the threats that she does, that she has to have 24-7 uh, federal police protecting her, then this is how bad we are getting, you know? 
And so my thing is, the no campaign's just done what everyone has done in political campaigns, except uh, we were forced, because we had no money, we were, uh, and we didn't have any support from any of the corporates. And so we just went and talk, spoke to people. That's all we did. Can I, can I ask though, some, some of those uh, points that you've outlined, do you, are, are they points that you, are, you agree with now? Or do you think that, um, or do you think there is distorted truth? Do you think that, would you say that, you know, a, a voice would be, a, a, you know, a replica of ATSIC? Now, uh, look, I, I, I don't necessarily say that because ADSEP was a, a monetary body. It had funds and it divvied out money. No one's talking about that. Well, not that I know of. No one's talking about that with the voice. It, you know, it's, it's about representation to government and to and to the uh, parliament. Uh, for me, for me, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it's the same old, same old. You know, we we've. For, since 1973, uh, 73, 74, we've had Indigenous, um, uh, call them voices, uh, to, to the government. The, uh, the Whitlam government set up the first one. And, and we've had them ever since. And what they do is they advise government. And governments can ignore them and governments can uh, take those advice on. Which is the exact words that the Prime Minister said about the voice. So, uh, well, so what's well, the difference between that and what, we, what, what the voice is going to do? We'll have to wrap it up there for this question. Mm. We'll go to another question. Mm. We are running out of time. Mm. By the way, we just went off air for a moment there. I hope you don't mind, Mr Mundine. That's Daniel mm, Andrews has resigned happen. as Premier of Victoria. Wow. So um, your, your broadcast is interrupted. <laughs> I believe we're back on the air now. But we... <laughs> oh, behave yourselves, everyone, please. <laughs> and we'll, we'll go to the last couple of questions. The next question is from Alex Mitchell. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Oh, Dean. Yeah. Uh, Alex Mitchell from AAP Newswire. Um, the Yes campaign's probably will be spent more time than the No campaign talking about how the referendum will be received internationally and what the potential, I guess, in, like reputational implications would be if Australia was to deliver a no verdict, I suppose. Do you believe that uh, a no vote would damage Australia's reputation internationally? And I suppose, alternatively, what impacts do you think a yes vote would have on Australia's inter in reputation internationally? Whether it's a yes vote or whether it's a no vote, I, I can, I, you know, I'm sorry to tell everyone in Australia, the Americans and Europeans don't get out of bed and think about, oh, gee, what's Australia doing today? You know, they don't. They couldn't give a crap. I can tell you that now. I, I, I sit on the boards of uh, international mining companies and, uh, and we go out and raise capital and money and no one's ever mentioned the voice to us. Not one single person. They don't really care about Australia. And, and also this idea that we're going to be this pariah. Mate, look at some of the countries in the world that we do business with and how they treat their own citizens. We're still doing business with them. So I don't understand this nonsense, and that's what it is, nonsense, that, uh, uh, that, um, uh, that we, you know, the world's going to just turn around and say, oh, bugger Australia, they said no, or they said yes, or whatever. They don't care. I can tell you that now. The, the <laughs> next question, in fact, our last question is from Eleanor Campbell. Thank you, Mr Mundine. Eleanor Campbell from NCA Newswire. Um, you've spoken a lot recently about an uptick in racial abuse that you've experienced. Um, you've linked it to the initiation of the referendum. If the voice does fail and we move towards accelerating conversations about treaties, um, do you think that racial abuse will decline? So what will decline? If the voice goes down and we start talking more about treaties, do you think that racial abuse will decline, will go down? Well, I hope so. Look, one of the things that we've... Um we've really got to focus on is the day after. Now, whether, whether the voice it gets up or whether the voice gets down, we could uh, wake up to a divided country, especially if the vote's close. You know, it's like 51-49. That is, to either side, that will really divide this country. 
and that's my concerns that you know so w what we've got to do is you know bury the hatchet and start working together our biggest issue after the 14th will be to get up in the morning and fix these problems that people are suffering in in this country and fix it with sensible outcome driven results and we've got to work with each other you know we've got to put our hand out to people we're arguing with and fighting with now to move forward now i've i've said that if yes gets up i'm going to do that and if no gets up i'm hoping the other side will do the same thing Thank you.